Okay, it's going to be a review of TNA Slammiversary 2009. So we got Slammiversary coming up on July 15th. Uh, you're going to get Alex Shelley taking on Nick Aldis for the Impact World title. Uh, Chris Sabin's taking on Leo Russ for the X Division title. Deanna Perrazzo taking on Trinity, formerly known as Naomi, uh, for, the, uh, for the Women's Championship or Knockouts Championship. Uh, you're going to get Mike Bailey and Jonathan Gresham in a multi-man Ultimate X match. So th there looks like there's some good stuff on it. I wouldn't say the card looks spectacular. Uh, it'll be hard to top last year's show. I thought last year's show was phenomenal with, you know, the great rest combination of great wrestling and great nostalgia. But uh, but we'll see what happens. So that's on July 15th. Um, so we're going all the way back to June 21st, 2009. This is from the Palace of Auburn Hills in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, big arena. This might be the biggest venue I think TNA ever tried to run in. Uh, so they only do 4,000 in attendance. I think lockdown 2008, they topped that as, as far as uh, ticket sales. But, uh, but yeah, this will probably be the biggest arena. Um, you know, Jared was saying 2009, uh, surprisingly, was the most profitable year in TNA history. I think when you combine the ticket sales, uh, you know, television ratings, uh, it does make sense. But from a pay-per-view buy rate standpoint, the pay-per-views were very negatively received in 2009 for the most part. And apparently this only did like 7,000 buys. That's the only number I could find for it. And, you know, Slammiversaries didn't normally do that well compared to Bound for Glory or Lockdown. But yeah, um, but yeah, like th that that was the perception of TNA that the pay-per-views were not delivering in 2009. However, though, this was one pay-per-view that uh, did deliver. And th this was the first pay-per-view of 2009 that I ordered. I did the review on YouTube. And the general consensus was that it was a pretty uh, fun show. It was an exciting show. Uh, this is one show that did deliver because of the King of the Mountain matches, the X Division and the main event Mafia one. Um, so here we go. So first match on the show, we're, we're going to get Curtis Granderson. And I know th this might be a horrible mix, you know, to combine baseball with wrestling, because I, I just don't think there's a lot of wrestling fans that like baseball as well. I'm probably one of the few rare ones that does. So Curtis Granderson of the Detroit Tigers was actually the, um, the title holder here. So you had to grab the belt from him. Um, Granderson is great though I didn't know him at the time Eventually he would come to the Mets and the Yankees I believe he actually set a home run record For the most home runs At the new Yankee Stadium for the Yankees I'm assuming Aaron Judge probably has passed that by now um, But he also helped the Mets get to the World Series in 2015 I, I'm a huge fan of Granderson He's actually great uh, on the on the post-game show for TBS with, with the baseball playoffs But the bottom line is At the time uh, you know, Jared thought it would, would be a, a great way to get extra ticket sales uh, to promote a Detroit Tiger being at the show. So you definitely understand it from that standpoint. But, you know, is wrestling and baseball the best best mix? TNA has done it time and time again. I don't really think it works, to be honest with you. But um, they're in the Palace of Auburn Hills, so I definitely understand it. You want to you get those extra ticket sales. So, uh, But, hey, the most important thing is we got the King of the Mountain match for the X Division Championship. I believe this is the only time King of the Mountains has been done for the X Division. It just kind of makes you think, man, they should have done this more often because you could definitely argue this as being the best King of the Mountain. I mean, just in terms of athleticism, spots, execution, this was sweet. The crowd was great as well. Um, I, I kind of agree with True Slayer, though. Like, th this felt a lot more spot happy than the main event. The main event kind of thrived on the story uh, more so than the spots. This was just strictly about um you know spots here and um but i thought it was good though I, I thought it was really really good you know the the only story that i really kind of uh focused on was them kind of ganging up on suicide which is almost like a half-hearted attempt so you have suicide defending the belt against the motor city machine guns of alex shelley chris saban who we'll we'll see at slammiversary this year uh consequences creed and jay lethal i'll tell you man the match was sweet the fans really weren't that into suicide, though. I think they wanted to see a new champion. I, I also feel like there was somewhat of a disconnect because, you know, you didn't really know who he was behind the mask. You weren't sure if it was Frankie or whether it was Daniels. So I think that hurt it as well. And I, I just think at this time, like, you, you really needed to have that character show a little bit more personality, a little bit more depth. It just felt like some, it felt like it could have been anybody. 
underneath that mask at that time. And I, I think that's what hurt him more than anything. But uh, Saban was the MVP here. You know, his execution of the Tornado DDT, the, the cross body off the top of the um, penalty box was sweet. You know, Shelly brought his A game. The machine guns are the MVPs of the match, like no, no doubt about it. Um, probably the craziest spot in the match was the catapult from Jay Lethal. I, I believe it was suicide. He did a leg drop on one of the ladders, and Lethal went catapulting off the top rope from the ladder. It was, it was crazy. Lethal hit his Macho Man elbow drop on a ladder that was set up onto the outside. I mean, just so much creativity here. Um, it was sweet, man. Sweet, sweet stuff trying to think of something else that uh really stands out here yeah so i mean they ganged up on suicide they did the roman reigns stack pin on suicide to send him to the penalty box but still suicide still comes out on top he ends up winning there was actually a a, a, a ladder tower set up from the penalty box and he hits the ace crusher on shelly and then they kind of boo uh suicide as he's grabbing the belt so yeah i mean I, I just think the match the match could have been a little bit better had they had the right guy go over, but it was still a lot of fun, man. It was it was awesome stuff. Shelly and Saban just they look like they're in their athletic prime here. Uh, so definitely the match of the night, and I might just say it. I, I think this is the best King of the Mountain match. I, I really think it is. Um, you, you just you you just have everybody in this match was just you know had the skill set and the body type for a ladder match i think the problem with one of the well, problem with the king of the mountain matches in the main event scene like a lot of those guys are just not made like for ladder matches like um i, I hate to say it, i don't think jared's a great ladder match guy um you know just some of the guys that they had some of the previous ladder matches for the king of the mountain just they're just not ideal like for that for that uh for that main event spot with the king of the mountain so but yeah Awesome, awesome stuff right there. So next up, we got Christopher Daniels taking on Shane Douglas. Uh, yeah, this match is really negatively perceived uh, at the time. So Shane, you know, they brought in Shane to be a manager um, at first. But at, at this point, he was trying to get... Um, he, it's actually a second chance match. He was trying to get rehired in TNA. So this was a second chance. He was kind of jealous that uh, Jeff Jarrett uh, gave Daniel special treatment, even though he actually lost to Feast of Fire. So he had a good, he had a pretty good storyline here. Um, I think it's, a, I think the matchup definitely had potential because Shane is amazing on the mic. You know, a, a lot of people that grew up watching ECW would, would, would definitely agree that he's the most important you know, person to actually come out of ECW and just a lot of it had to do with his mic work. And then Daniels is great on the mic as well. So I think this definitely did have potential. Uh, but Shane at the time, though, Shane just couldn't back it up in the ring. He um, he did an interview backstage where he's talking to the blonde girl. I think her name is Lauren and uh, just really talking down to her, just being a prick. And, you know, sometimes being an asshole, acting like an asshole it works for pro wrestling, and Shane was really, really good at that. Um, but he just couldn't back it up in the ring. Any type of offense on Daniels here just did not go over well. Anytime Daniels was trying to, you know, rotate him by doing a suplex, it, it was tough to actually move Shane at this point. So the match didn't come off well. I thought Daniels looked good, though. Daniels got a great reaction. The best moonsault ever came off great. Just the way Daniels moved, he was, he was, he was good at this time. He actually had... Kind of had a weird-looking uh, mustache here, but other than that, I thought Daniels did the best he could do. But Shane, at this point, Shane was just done. I just don't think he could perform anymore uh, in the ring. But, you know, I, I get what they were going for in terms of, uh, you know, this being a, a great mix of styles on the microphone, no doubt about it. All right, next up we have Angelina Love uh, defending the Knockouts Championship against uh, Tara, uh, formerly known as uh, Victoria from the WWE. Uh, kind of a disappointing match right here. I thought I thought this definitely had potential. Um. It's funny, these knockout matches on television, they, they did very well. They, they produced a lot of revenue, a lot of ratings. Um, I think at the time, match quality wise, it was probably a step down or you know pretty much on the same level as you know any diva search type of wrestling you would see in the WWE. But I, I, I think they were trying to present themselves as the alternative uh, to the PG era. I think because WWE is PG, they felt like they needed to make this look like they're at an adult film convention or the or a, a strip club. And you know, I'll give them credit. Like Ange Angelina Love and the Beautiful People, 
Madison Rain and Velvet Sky. I, I think the theme music was on point. I think the entrance uh, was cutting edge, uh, you know, even for that time. But I think what matches like this did, it just, it, it just turned away a lot of the diehard fans. Some of the fans that started watching TNA and Ring of Honor, you know, in June of 2002, when there was no other alternative, it, 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 it turns away fans like that more than anything. But the bottom line is, you know, beautiful people get the victory here. Thought the match could have been a little bit better, but we'll, we'll move on to the Monsters Ball match. We got Abyss and Taylor Wilde uh, taking on Daphne and Raven. And then you got um, Dr. Stevie, Stevie Richards uh, with Raven. So you're kind of continuing uh, that ECW uh, friendship with, with Raven and Stevie. So that, that was pretty cool. And, and no, I, I didn't really know this at the time. So Daphne um, was CM Punk's girlfriend in, in Ring of Honor. It definitely makes sense. I just wasn't sure. See, the problem is in Ring of Honor at the time, they didn't have a women's division. I don't really know if they even mentioned, um, you know, Daphne by her name at that time. She might have went by another name. But the bottom line is this was CM Punk's girlfriend in 2003 in Ring of Honor. Um, that got taken out by BJ Whitmer. But uh, at this point, I thought the women were good here. I think Taylor Wilde is underrated. You know, she, she's got a, you know, a very you know, energetic, you know, vibe to her. Uh, Daphne's more of like the gothic chick. And it, yeah, they, they were good here. They actually, the women actually brought the match up. I just think Abyss and Raven at this time, they kind of lost a little bit of that spark, especially Raven. I think Raven actually had a, a nice little run in 2005 with the ECW nostalgia. But I just think at this point, they, they lost a little bit of the magic. So the women definitely helped them, helped them here. Daphne took a thumbtack bump. Uh, Taylor Wilde took a table bump. And, you know, Abyss and Raven, they could have done a little bit better, but there was some great execution with the Black Hole Slam, and, you know, Stevie got involved, and it, it was it was good drama. Good drama, good Monsters Ball, definitely probably the best, I, I would actually say this is the best match in between the two King of the Mountain matches. All right, next up we got Sting taking on Matt Morgan. Um... Yeah, someone actually compared this to Sting versus the Giant in WCW. I, that that's an interesting comparison. I I don't know if um, if that's on point. I thought this really did have potential, though. You know, they they built Matt Morgan up as this genetic freak who thrived in basketball and football, a, a multi-sport athlete um, that was big, seven feet tall. Uh, to his, to, he actually gave his genetics uh to different universities for you know and just a whole bunch of great stuff that really kind of presented matt morgan out to be a, a superstar here i think if matt morgan had won he would uh, eventually join the main event mafia um it was i thought sting worked hard here he worked his ass off he bumped for matt morgan really really well there was one blown spot with these with the Scorpion death drop and the fans just started booing. The fans just lost interest. But other than, if it wasn't for that one blown spot, I, I thought it was really, really good though. I, I, I think they did the best that they could. I think, you know, Sting, he's not great in this situation. Like, like Angle was able to carry Morgan to, you know, a, a really, really good match. You know, the, a, a match that was almost a four star match. I just think, you know, Sting is, it's, he's not quite, you know, um, the perfect guy you know, to, to carry a, a, a jacked up big dude to an amazing match. I just don't think that's what Sting, you know, thrives in. But the bottom line is he did the best he could to make, make Matt Morgan look like a monster. And for the most part, it was an interesting match. Um, Sting is able to hit the Scorpion death drop from the top rope, which came off a lot better. So they definitely rebounded. You know, you, you got to give Sting credit because, you know, once the fans start booing like that, you know, they, they could easily just start shitting on just everything. But they definitely, you know, picked it up and rebounded from that. But, uh, you know, not a great match, but not not as bad as you would expect, though. All right, next up, we got Beer Money uh, taking on Team 3D um, for the TNA Tag Team Championships. Uh, so, so Beer Money actually won the... Uh, invitational uh, team 3d is actually the champions let me get that right here yeah they got maybe too much time i thought um i thought the match was good i, th I thought beer money was really impressive here you could definitely see james storm and robert rude really coming into their own uh you know even their athleticism and their fundamentals just they just had a great combination of everything so uh they definitely planted some nice seeds here for their singles run um 
I think Bubba and Devon worked really, really hard here. Like they worked really hard. Uh, the the problem is I just don't think you know conditioning wise they were ready for a match that was this long. But you know, they 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 gave it their best effort though. You know Bubba actually uh, you know does a high spot out of the ring, which you know shocked the hell out of me. It, uh, D- Devon was just moving a little bit lethargic like at certain parts of the match. You had the British invasion. Uh, I think the British invasion stuff kind of brought it down. They were on commentary and then they interfered in the match, so it just felt like something that could have been on impact. Uh, I would definitely agree with that, but you know, Beer Money actually uh, gets the victory with the um, the DWI drinking while investing. It's it's almost like an assisted suplex into a snapshot. So that was a cool finish. But uh, yeah, I, I gotta say though, the the magic for Team 3D once again, it just it just felt like with with this time in TNA, th- there's just so many guys on the roster that. Um, had just had just lost it in terms of conditioning, in terms of just uh, you know being in their prime in the ring. But it was a great effort from Team 3D. Uh, you know, even though they were cut from WWE, you know they clearly made a lot of money with TNA and and with uh, New Japan. They, at the time, they were uh, Impact champions and IWGP Tag champions. So. And then we're going to move on to the main event for the King of the Mountain match for the TNA World Title. We got Mick Foley. Defending the belt against Kurt Angle, AJ Styles, Jeff Jarrett, and Samoa Joe. So the the main storyline here was that Jarrett wanted to take his company back. He felt like he couldn't trust Foley. Foley was kind of like in between, you know, not quite main event mafia, but he was kind of uh, he was kind of like on an ego trip after winning the belt from Sting. I don't know, man. I, I think Foley Foley winning the championship. It it just once again like I very similar to Team 3D. It just he just felt like he was, you know, past his prime. You know, the matches didn't really click the way that they did with Randy Orton at Backlash. It just didn't have that feeling at all, uh, in my opinion. But, you know, what, what I think Foley really brought to T- his biggest value to TNA was, you know, promos and storylines. I think someone like Foley can really make you invested in, you know, you know, storylines. And, and I, I think that's what Foley did. But I think when it came down to, you know, performing you know, in main events, he, he just, he just couldn't get a lot out of him. But in a match like this, you know, you could hide some of his weaknesses because he's not asked to, you know, be in the spotlight the whole exact time. Um, so a little bit of a weird match. So if you're not a, if you're not a baseball fan, you're not a hockey fan, this will be a tough pay-per-view to get into because Kurt Angle actually comes down to the ring with a Pittsburgh Penguins uh, jersey on. Uh, them and the Detroit Red Wings have a big rivalry. So Joe actually puts on a Red Wings jersey and the crowd goes crazy. And uh, because of, because he attacks Angle before the match, uh, Joe actually ends up in the penalty box first. So that, that really kind of, I don't know, I, I just thought it was kind of a weird way to start the match. Kind of gave it a goofy type of tone. But they definitely turned it around. I I remember at the time, I really thought this delivered. I did not see the swerve coming. The swerve really came out of nowhere. But uh, I, I would say the fan favorite in this thing with, it was AJ Styles. Uh, fans definitely wanted to see AJ win this thing. Uh, AJ was great. You know, he, he's awesome in these King of the Mountain matches. He took the biggest bumps. He he was the most energetic, the most athletic. Uh, him and Angle did some great stuff, too. They, um, you know, they teased the Tornado DDT. Uh, Angle was able to counter it into a northern light, you know, belly to belly into the ladder. So they they did some beautiful stuff together. There was even some really, 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 really nice um, transitions into the Styles Clash from AJ. Uh, Jarrett in this match, I I mean, he was kind of just there. The fans were kind of lukewarm on him. They just, they didn't, at this time, they weren't booing him. They really weren't cheering him. He was just kind of there just to... You know, he didn't really want to win the TNA title. He just wanted to have possession of it, and then he was going to do whatever he wanted with it. Uh, I I do not think this is prime Samoa Joe. I just feel like when Joe became the nation of violence, Samoa Joe, I I just feel like this is officially Joe being out of his prime. Uh, He's still young at this time. He still moved pretty well, but... I don't know. I just didn't get that same feeling from Joe that I got in 2005. Uh, but he did work hard here. I think Joe definitely did, you know, play his role here to a T. I, I just think at this time, the Samoa Joe and Kurt Angle feud, uh, I think people have seen enough of it. They've been feuding for three years already. You, you had to mix it up and do something different. So um, after they, you know, knock AJ off the ladder, 
uh, Angle and Joe, uh, you know, going up the ladder, and, and then surprisingly, Joe just uh, gives. And that that's the cool thing about these King of the Mountain matches, because you don't have to grab the belt. You have to go up with the belt, and Joe uh, just kind of gives Angle the belt out of the blue, and then Angle hangs it up, and then he... Gives him the uh, Italian-like kiss, you know, the mafia. You know, the, the mafia is a lot of the Italians. Isaiah and uh, Magic Johnson, they used to kiss each other, and Isaiah said that they got the idea from the Italians. So you saw uh, Angle and Joe actually kiss each other after all the wars that they had been through. But it was cool. Um, I just didn't see it coming at the time. I do not think this did anything for the Samoa Joe fans that – Grew up loving him in Ring of Honor. Uh, if anything, I think I think a lot of those fans had kind of thrown in the towel by now. But at the same time, this was a good way to give uh, Angle the belt back. This is the most hair Kurt Angle's ever had since Judgment Day 2002. He had the beard and then he had the hair on the sides. He's still pretty much bald. Wasn't crazy about this look for Kurt. But um, at this time, Kurt really seemed like he was comfortable. And uh, his mic skills... You could definitely argue Kurt Angle's mic skills around this time were, were better than ever. I, I, and he definitely seemed a lot more with it at this time than I think he does now. Um, but, you know, a lot of time has just, just gone by since then. Uh, Foley, I thought, I thought it was a good performance by Foley. You know, he, he did the one elbow drop off the penalty box. But, um, you know, you would expect Foley to kill himself in a match like this. But I, I thought AJ actually took the bigger bump. He actually took a bump from Foley off the penalty box, and he flipped into the ring. So it, the match definitely had some really, really good high spots. But at the same time, I just feel like th this this was a this is a great mix of talent. You just had a lot of star power here. You had star power that made it made a name for itself in WWE, WCW, ECW, Ring of Honor, uh, and TNA as well. All the all these guys had ties to all of those companies. Um, so I thought it was a good King of the Mountain match. Like, uh, it, it really it really was a, you know, it, it just had a lot of star power to it. Now, if, if you want to argue to me that the swerve didn't make sense and, you know, the booking was very Russo, like, I don't know if it was a Russo decision, but um, this Mick Foley title reign was very, very short. He only held it from lockdown until Slammiversary. Um, So there we go. But uh, I, at this point, Kurt Angle holding the TNA world title, it didn't really, um, it didn't really make me excited as a Kurt Angle fan at, at, at this point. It was, it was, it was really kind of tough uh, to get behind them. I think they did Angle and Foley the next month at Victory Road. That that, ma that match must have been a disaster, man. You know, that's not the reason why Victory Road got so negatively, uh, you know, perceived. But. Um, you would think Angle and Foley would be something special, but you gotta you gotta blame those guys because if that if that that's I would say more than any other show in the history of YouTube, that show got more criticism than any other show in YouTube history. So you'd have to blame Angle and Foley uh, for some of that because they had the burden of of main eventing that show. So I'll just end it right there. I'm a huge Kurt Angle fan, but this isn't one Kurt Angle moment that you know I jump up and down for when I see it, but. It was it was a nice little swerve to to see Joe and and Kurt Angle uh, finally, you know, side with each other after all those wars. But Slammiversary 2009, you got you got two great King of the Mountain matches. The middle of the show, it was hit or miss. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't it wasn't anything special. But um, that's pretty much it, guys. Slammiversary 2009, and I'm out. All right.